Hi everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Classic Gamer 74. I'm your host, Anthony Gamer, and today, before I get started with the game, I'd like to introduce a new member of the Classic Gamer 74 family. This is QCat. Hi everyone, welcome back to Classic Gamer 74. I'm QCat, and I'm just happy to have a new job. He sure is. And many of you may know QCat. Those of you that, um... Are, were big fans of Radio Shack. He was uh, kind of a last-ditch effort in some ways to help save Radio Shack. Yeah, and I'm just glad that I got a job for a change. Oh, yeah. Um, but anyway, in today's episode, we're going to discuss one of my all-time favorite NES games, and that is Kabuki Quantum Fighter. So anyway, I decided it was a good idea to bring this guy on, because... I was a big fan of Radio Shack, and I just love anything cat-related. Oh, it was so nice of you to give me a job. Yep, now, many of you probably are familiar, uh, if you are familiar with uh, Radio Shack. Uh, QCat was, like I said, a last-ditch effort of theirs to come up with something unique to draw people back into the stores. Now, if you can tell by these uh, hookups, you can kind of see that you would hook him into a computer, and then you would scan... Uh, like an, a, a newspaper ad for Radio Shack, and I think he was supposed to send you to like a website and like maybe have discounts on that item or something along those lines. At the time, it was, I guess, revolutionary, but unfortunately, it wasn't a big success and it didn't really help uh, Radio Shack that much. Yeah, it was one of those good ideas that just didn't happen. True. But today, like I said, we're going to talk about about Kabuki Quantum Fighter. Now, before we get into the game, let's learn a little bit about the game itself. All right, now, Kabuki Quantum Fighter is a 2D platform game developed by Human Entertainment and published by HAL Laboratory for the Nintendo Entertainment System. It was originally released on December 21st, 1990 in Japan and was released in January 1991, for the North American market before being released in Europe on February 20th, 1992. Okay, now the story is, in the year 2056, a virus has appeared in the main defense computer of the planet. The origin and nature are unknown. Players adopt the persona of a 25-year-old Colonel Scott O'Connor, a military agent who has transferred his brain into raw binary code using experimental technology in order to combat a rogue program in the main defense computer. When O'Connor enters the system, his body transforms uh, into the what is a kabuki actor. The virus in the virtual world takes on properties of an actual virus. It leaves behind debris, mutant creatures, and parasite environments of a biological nature. So, Basically, this is a side-scrolling, um, each level, again, is a side-scrolling single room with a boss at each end of the level. Now, the cool thing is Connor's primary weapon is his long hair. He whips the villains with his hair and destroys them. But you can actually pick up other chip-based weaponry on as you go along to um, fight against enemies. Yeah, that's cool. Go ahead and tell them about how you discovered it in the first place. Okay, so I was looking through an issue of Nintendo Power Magazine, like most of us did at that time. Luckily, my parents were kind enough to give me a subscription for, like, years and years. God, I wish I still had those. Honestly, truly, I wish I still had them. If any of you watching this video have a collection of Nintendo Power Magazines that you would like to part with, uh, please let me know in the comments below or connect with me on the social media platforms and, and let me know because I would love to have those back. Anyway, so there was an article, it was towards the end of the magazine I remember, and it talked about some games that were coming out that had unlikely heroes, and one of the ones that was listed was uh, this computer, this uh, quantum fighter guy who uses hair as a weapon. They also mentioned the game Werewolf, and and I'm like, wow, that sounds pretty cool. I definitely got to try it out. And at the time, you know, you had if you wanted to try a game out, essentially you had to rent it or something because 
they weren't going to have displays up in every store allowing you to play every single NES game that was coming out. Usually they were the regular Nintendo based games. Uh, but so anyway, I rented it from the video store and I loved it right from the start. Now, just because I said that I love the game from the start doesn't mean I was all that good at it. Yeah, that's for sure. Now, you got to remember, people, that sometimes you get these games for the NES and you think, oh, I'm going to do great at it. And then you play it and you're like, oh, this is a lot harder than I thought it was. Exactly. And this was definitely one of those cases. Besides the fact that it is a platformer, you really, really need good uh, hand-eye coordination and reaction time, which, as this game is as this game progresses, you find out that you really, really have to have good <laughs> dexterity skills, which I didn't have even when I was young. Uh, just because I love gaming doesn't mean I'm one of the greatest gamers of all time. Oh, that's for sure. Nobody asked you. Um, I love gaming and I love games, but I'm not really all that good at it. I mean, I was never on any of those um, top ten lists or, you know, one of those people that was frequently on the completed list on uh, in, in Nintendo Power Magazine or anything like that. So, but, yeah, to give you an idea how hard this game is, it took him nearly 30 years to beat the darn thing. Yep, you said it. Now, as you progress further into the game, um, O'Connor learns more about the virus and what it comes from, where it comes from, perhaps what its overall goal is. And you get better weapons. Uh, of course, the hair is awesome. It's kind of cool to be able to thrash and destroy your enemies, but you get more chip-based weaponry as time goes on. For instance, you get the energy gun, the fusion gun, the quantum bombs, and the remote-controlled bolo. Personally, I like the uh, spread gun. That's one that I will probably use throughout the course of the game because it in my opinion is the best one but you get some really cool weaponry and yeah you really need it as time goes on at the end of each stage you will fight a boss like I said earlier most of the bosses aren't really that difficult you just have to memorize the patterns um, and utilize your weapons but be careful when you use your chip weapons because you only have so many chips and as time goes on you know, you kind of run out of them. Uh, to be honest, my advice is to try to save your chip energy as much as you can until you get to a boss, because that's the best bet you have against them is simply using your chip energy. But there are times throughout the game where you're going to have to. So, but like I said, the best advice I can give is save save that chip energy as much as you can. Now, this is the level where I got stuck these moving platforms moving up and if you fall you go right back to the beginning or you fall down far enough where it's aggravating and it's a pain to keep going now I know what some of you are probably thinking well you know it was Nintendo and if you really really had trouble getting past a level or got stuck on a game all you had to use was this wonderful invention yep the game genie However, the Game Genie does not make every single game completely beatable. Um, there are a couple games out there uh, that if you use the Game Genie, it makes it easier, but you still kind of have to do a lot of it on your own. A good example of that would be Ninja Gaiden, uh, which I will talk about in another episode, and Legend of Zelda. You can have every cheap possibly used on Legend of Zelda, but you still gotta know where the heck you're going. Which, of course, is the biggest challenge of Legend of Zelda is that the Hyrule is just such a vast place, and you really gotta get a map to figure out where you're going. But we'll talk about that in another episode. In this case, it's the, like I said, the dexterity and hand-eye coordination that you need to get past this. So, regardless of whatever cheats I used, with this game, I still had a whole heck of a lot of trouble beating this level. And on and off over a period of 30 years, I still hadn't gotten past this level until here recently. 
Okay, so the big question is, how did you get past it? Well, all right, I, I admit that I did use Game Genie. However, um, as time has gone on, more people have made their own custom codes for Game Genie, and I don't know how they did it, but I found another code that really helps when it comes to getting past platforms that are very, very difficult to get past. Anyway, so I continued on with the game, and oh boy, it just got more and more difficult as time went on, which of course is what you expect from an NES game. Um, so, continuing on, you find out eventually that the virus itself is of alien origin. Uh, you kind of always wonder about that. Is it going to be, you know, a terrorist organization? But nope, you find out later it is aliens that are actually behind this entire thing. Um, but like I said, the storyline is so cool. In this. I love the story. I love the character you play. Uh, and you find out later, too, the, the backstory is that Scott O'Connor is um, a descendant of a Kabuki actor. Now, those of you that may not be familiar with Kabuki Theater, it's a Japanese form of theater. Um, and he takes on the role of a lion dancer. Uh, looks just like it. If you ever, ever watched Kabuki Theater, I highly recommend it. Go to that channel, NHK, and... There's a show all about it on there, and you can learn about the actors that perform it and the stories behind it. It's really, really fascinating and something you do need to check out. Now, if I had to compare this to a more commercially known game, I would honestly have to say that this game compares a lot to the Mega Man series, except for I really enjoy this more. I, I would never really got into Mega Man when I was a kid. I, I am now, and yeah, I'm going to definitely discuss those games in a later episode, but it, I just love the character himself. He's just pretty cool. Now, I found out recently that there are differences between the version that we got here in the West and the version that was released in Japan. According to what I read, the uh, original Famicom version was ba was uh, designed to be a tie-in to a 1990 Kai uh, Kaizo Hayashi film called Zipang. Now, in the Japanese version of this game, you actually are a 15-year-old boy named Bobby Yano who transforms into his samurai ancestor, Jigoku Goku Kora Kuma Maru. God, I really hope I didn't butcher that that bad. Uh, so it is kind of inspired by the film in a lot of ways. Now, if you've never seen the film, it's interesting. It's definitely one of those movies you kind of gotta turn your brain off when you see it because it's it's it, you know it's silly and stuff. It's one of those kind of movies that we used to watch on Saturday afternoon on Channel Thirty Two. You know, those martial arts kind of movies, except for this one, you know, with swords and stuff. It's, it's, it's a fun movie, but it's, it's goofy as can be. But regardless, um, I, if you enjoyed this game, I would highly recommend checking out the original Japanese version. The cutscenes are different. The story itself is kind of different. It's, the gameplay is identical, but there's a couple subtle things that make it a, almost a whole nother experience. If you'd like to actually see the differences between the two versions, the East and the West, of this game, head over to my Patreon page. I'm going to have a video on there where I show complete playthrough of both games. So uh, head over to my Patreon page, and for as little as a dollar a month, you can help this channel to grow and see some videos that are a little too hot for YouTube. So please, be generous and help us out on Patreon. The link is in the description below. In our next episode, I'm going to review the Atari Flashback Classics Volume 1, 2, and 3 for the PlayStation 4. Well, that brings this episode of Classic Gamer 74 to a close. I really hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah! I really enjoyed it. Well, I'm sure I really did too. And if you did enjoy it, please let us know by giving us a big thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. And don't forget to click that little bell icon down there so you'll be notified when we upload any new episodes. 
Don't forget to connect with me on all my social media platforms. Check out my Teespring store to help support this channel. And check out my uh, internet radio station where you'll hear the best hard rock and heavy metal. Well, until next time, I'm Anthony Gamer. I'm QCat. And we will see you all in the next episode. Until next time, go ahead. Be strong, be safe, be happy, be healthy, and above all, take care of each other, be kind to each other, and stop hate of all kinds. Bye, everyone. Bye. I'll see you guys next time.